this immediate attention that we require. It's wrong. And the thing is, what's happened is they've opened up, when I say they, social media businesses, have opened up this thing inside us that make us require it more. Now, I'm, I'm as guilty as everyone else. I put a post up, I want to see them fucking likes. I want that dopamine <laughs> hit. Are you kidding me? I want that. That's why, I, partly I put it up for love, of course. I yeah. want to share. Oh, look, art's oh, amazing. It saves lives. It's the best thing in the world. And this is what I've paid. This is what my friends paid. Yeah. Look at this photo. Where's my fucking like? <laughs> So I'm very selfish with it because I don't like anyone's photos and I don't comment. But it's mainly for my own protection. Yeah. I don't want to get caught up in that world. I'm already, if I'm posting, I'm caught up. Yeah. I step in any further and start commenting on everyone's pieces, that's 10 minutes gone. I start fucking liking everything, that's another 10 minutes gone. And before you know it, two hours of my day is gone on fucking Instagram. No thanks. Hello and welcome back to Conversations with myself, Francis Co. Ladies and gentlemen, once again, we have another exciting show ahead. It is no secret that inspiration is the mother of all amazing things, and there's no better place to get inspiration than art. My next guest strongly believed that art rules the world. His love and talent for art goes back to when he was just three years of age. Little did anyone know that in years to come, this would be the start to opening only the second ever graffiti shop in London, which he would go on to start his own agency for artists, open a recording shop, employing people and giving back to the community. Having a successful podcast, producing a magazine during lockdown, he would also become a well-known artist who is sought after by many, many brands. He could find his work all over Camden and all over around the world. Please, Make no mistake, this did not come as easy as it makes his artwork look. Only at the age of 15, he had a helicopter chased by police for graffiti on the wall. If this was not scary enough, he went and got another helicopter chase in Bulgaria for doing the same thing. Please allow me to welcome to the show an amazing proud father, a man who is willing to cycle from London to Brighton and back just for the fun of it, David Samuels. <laughs> Thank you, Francis. Welcome to the Thank show, you, Sir David. Welcome to the show. <sighs> Thank you. Nice intro, man. Oh, thank you. It was, yeah, it was actually quite fun looking up. Like, rah. And obviously, I left out a few bits on the intro. Yeah, yeah. We're going to get into it. I'll say um, I opened the first graffiti art gallery in the country. Oh, wow. And when I opened up in London, I opened up with the only graffiti shop in, in the city. Yes, That's yes. Creme and Black. Creme. So is it uh, at one point you thought you opened up only shop? Yeah, I mean... Then realised... There's this guy up north, um, cool guy. He opened a shop called The Bench. Um, none of us knew. Yeah. All around the same time. Okay. And so it's on, the re it's on record. It's on record. He opened the very first ever shop in London. There was we, no gallery. We no, clarified no. that. <clears throat> there was no gallery. And um, I did it. You've got an amazing journey. It's been quite a full on one, man. It's been good. And your love for art going deep as um, 15. Let's jump forward. I want to jump forward, then we'll go back. Mm -hmm. Your first ever canvas was a canvas of your son. That's right, yeah. Yeah, so um, I was 21. Yeah, Josh was born when I was 20. And then for his mum, for his first birthday, I did a painting of him for his mum. So I've been a graffiti writer since I was a kid. So I know how to use a spray can. And um, I was broke, living in Brighton. And I was like, all right, this is the type of present I can do. <clears throat> so I stole a canvas from Sussex Stationers and got it back to the house. And then, yeah, painted this piece for her, man. And at the time, I was doing shit jobs and selling weed. And my mates were like, D, that's your money. That's, that's your money. That's what you've got to do. My two friends, Gareth and Nick, Close friends of mine. Um, yeah, they just said, that's you. That's what you need to be doing is art. You got it. Wow. So that's, that was it. My first canvas, which then two years later opened up the first gallery. Oh, wow. 
And going back now, when did you realise that, you know what, I can do this graffiti thing? Uh, the graffiti thing goes back for fucking... I mean, I didn't actually start painting the streets till I was about 14, 15. But I was the kid in school that the teacher would say, oh, we need a poster for the fair. And I'd go to the back of the class and do bubble lettering posters for them, you know what I mean? And yeah. So I always had the knack. I've always been looking at graffiti since I was extremely young. My mum worked on Edgware Road and one of my earliest memories is a, a rest in peace mural for a DJ from Kiss FM when it was illegal, when it was a pirate station. This DJ died in a car crash. And all I remember is a piece of this massive painting of this Jeep and this, this DJ sitting out the window and in these wild style pieces next to it. And I must have been three, four years old when I saw that. And I've never forgot it. And that was, that was my, like, my sight on graffiti. But then taking it up, I didn't take it up till later on. A bit of pen tagging around the place, yeah. but I became Daz at 15 and um, yeah, painted the streets. And obviously back then it was a lot easier because I remember I'll come out of school, every, everyone had a tag. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yes, easier and, and not easier. I mean, I think the thing is at 15 and at 12, 13, 14, you don't realise the dangers, so it seems easy. And also, you're too young to actually cause a massive amount of impact. There was a time in my career, though, my graffiti career, where I could have gone to prison. I've got loads of friends who've gone to prison for graffiti, been locked up for three years, like ridiculous amounts of time for painting trains and painting walls. And um, there was a part of my career when I was in my mid early 20s, I was still painting the Bakerloo line. And um, if I got nicked, I would have gone to prison. I'd done enough damage for them to say, right. So you knew the risk. Yeah, Obviously but you by then the you're reward. in it. You, and the, what kept you going? So graffiti, graffiti basically showed me who I was really as a human, right? It, it brought out my qualities in, in my life. Before that, I ran around my estate thinking I was Mr. Big Bollocks. I was a brilliant shoplifter. I got into selling weed. I hung around with the right people and the wrong people, got involved in some bad shit, tried some good shit. But all the time I was trying to be someone else. I was never being myself. And when I literally was just like, nah, I'm gonna start painting. That's when everything came together. My confidence built my understanding of what I'm capable of, battling fears, learn not to be so scared of things, like make decisions. Graffiti puts a lot on you if you want to do it well. And then at the, main, the same time, all of it, the thing about graffiti is about your ego, especially mm -hmm. for young men. And I needed my ego built. It had to be, and it had to be genuine, not, not because of fear that I could inflict or even like the fear I might feel from someone because I didn't have any strength myself. When I became a writer, graffiti writer, and I really fucking like decided to make that move and do as much as I possibly could and go up the ranks in the, in the culture, that's when I started to build myself as human and realise what I'm capable of. Wow, so it's safe to say from a young age, you found your talent, found your purpose and went with it. Yeah, I mean, look, I knew I was an artist from three, four years old. Yeah. I knew I was a... I used to draw everything. And as I say, my teachers got me to do the lettering and all that type of shit. And I, I used to draw all the time, draw for my friends. But you grow up in an estate, in the middle of four other estates, in Kilburn, try and be an artist at 10. When you've got a single parent at home who's working all the time. And so you're just out in the estate. Try and be an artist. You can't. It wasn't cool. So you, I got diverted. And that was me trying to figure out, am I a rude boy? Am I a pussy? Am I a shoplifter? Am I a car thief? Am I a drug dealer? Am I a fighter? Do I do street robberies? What one shall I do? What one shall I pick? And I tried all of it. All right, touch wood, never went to prison for the stuff I committed. But none of that was me. I was never a rude boy. I'm not really a rude boy. I couldn't really back it. I had a mouth and I could fight. I could never back it. it wasn't, I couldn't do it for years and lock down the manor and be that man. It wasn't, it wasn't me and I tried got myself into some horrible situations through that behaviour. But I was growing. I was just learning to become an adult. But when I decided, when my world closed around me, shit got extremely dangerous, basically. Very dangerous for me outside. And um, as that happened, I realised I'm still no one. I have to become someone. Mm. And so I started writing. 
How hard was the transition? Obviously, you got your boys, you're rolling with them, you're doing what you're doing, and you had to tell them, guys, this is not for me. No, well, that's the thing. It Literally, my world split. There's only a couple of people who I could be with that were a consistent friend. My friend Greg from Rowley, my best mate, and uh, he, he stood by me through everything I did and would always tell, and he was a rude boy. I won't get it twisted, the dude was on it. But he would say to me, D, you shouldn't be with them people. It's not for you. D, that isn't you. And yeah, me and him did crime together. We even started graffiti together. But he, he just kept on saying to me, this ain't you. And then when shit, when the shit hit the fan and the problems arose and I had to step back and get out of the line that like I couldn't be in Kilburn, so I'm having to get up to West Hampstead to check on other friends. Mm. So it, my, Nick and Gareth, who became my graffiti partners, they came after all of that. They came, I started writing and I'm writing for like two years around Kilburn, end up started raving, going to clubs with different people and then I meet them two in a club and it was just like, oh, sick, we're all serious about the graffiti thing and so... So at this point, we're still doing graffiti for the love, not for the money. Oh, mate, no, there was yeah. no, you don't think about the money. Yeah. Graffiti's fucking, it's the, like, it's not about it. It's about proving yourself. Like, I ended up making a business, yeah, because I've got no qualifications. I've got no education. I've got no, nothing that anyone's going to say, oh, brilliant. And it's, at 20 especially, I had nothing. Left school at 15, like, you ain't got nothing. So it was only when having my son doing this painting, my friend saying to me, the fuck, D, you're shotting weed. And every now and then you've got a shit job. Well, not a shit job, but a job. No career, no, nothing to step forward to. You're just paying the bills with these little jobs you've got. And then that painting and the way they reacted to it and the, the encouragement they gave me led me to six months later producing four paintings, which I managed to get put into a cafe in Brighton. And we sold those four as well. And I'm like, oh my God, this is the shit. This is what I've got to do. And then that's when the business came. Yeah, and obviously that had its own challenges later down the yeah, line. Yeah, of course, of course. It started with the paintings, but at the same time, simultaneously, so I'm living in, I moved to Brighton when I was 20, right? I got out of Kilburn. I moved to Brighton when I was 20, broke up with Josh's mum, didn't know she was pregnant, right? I get to Brighton, shot weed, get shit jobs. And then I'm picking up keys in London and I'm also started to meet my mate John, who started to bring paint in from Spain. Now this guy, John from East London, He'd go all the way to Spain, fill up bags with spray paint and carry it all back to London. Mm. This was the first time we really had amazing spray paint in this country. There was a couple of other shops that had done it, but like hip hop shops got some a bit of paint in, but John literally was like, I'm doing this. So he started filling out a, uh, like a, a unit in Dalston. I'd go there, pick up a load of paint from him and bring that to Brighton to sell to all the graffiti writers down there. So I'm grabbing the weed in West London, I'm grabbing the paint in East London, I'm getting back on the train at Victoria, dragging it all back to my flat. Wow. Sitting room was the shotting spot. They have all the writers come up, they buy all the paint and they buy the weed. Then I started selling them t-shirts and I've got these paintings and I was like, this is me. And your work speaks for itself and, and people know you by this stage. Well, I got known in the graffiti world to an extent. Yeah. I had a network and when I moved to Brighton, I made sure that I made a concerted effort to paint as much as I could in Brighton as well to let them know Daz is here. Whoever this kid is, there's someone from London in our city painting loads. So I got to know everyone by just determination and persistence of writing my name everywhere and painting pieces. So that's how you build your network, you meet people, writers start to come to the flat to buy weed because they realise you're selling weed and they go, oh God, you've got paint? Yeah, I'll buy paint as well. And then I'll make some t-shirts. I'm like, you want to buy this t-shirt as well with your drawer? One thing led to the next. Mm. So you knew what they you knew what they wanted. We they want it. Yeah. And they come in and then you show them you have a product. Yeah. And they into it. How did you derive to that marketing strategy? Because it's it's brilliant. Skinny man. Skinny man taught me how to sell weed and um and to how to sell it properly. And it was just using those methods, which then led me to sell spray paint which led me to produce artworks, which led me to sell paintings. It's stages, and it's, it, look, it's, when you grow up with some, somewhere where you're not going to get the, the education, the school's not going to give that to you because they can't. The school was fucking mental. And um, your estate is fucking nuts, and aspiration is not a thing that we're meant to have from that part of town. 
You're not meant to be aspire. You're meant to just work. When I realised that I could aspire to do something, when I realised it was on me, the same way I realised with graffiti, if I want to paint trains, I've got to go and paint the fucking train. I can't think about it. I can't tell someone I've painted the train and not painted it. I've got to go and do it. And so you, you learn about aspiration. And so I just made sure that kept on building in me. Like I'll always aspire to do better and do more because I can. I wasn't taught that. Oh. The t- teachers didn't teach. My mum always showed me. A, she's like, you can do whatever you want, obviously. My mum was a great mum. But it was hard for her. Single parent, poor, all that shit. But aspiration. When I realised I could aspire to do things and then all that takes is the work to make the aspiration happen. You've got to put the hours in to make the aspiration happen. You put that together and you're like, all right, cool, I've got that. That's common sense. Let me do this. It takes ages. As a person who started off from nothing to Mm. where you are now, how can we, how how can you teach aspiration today? It's not about teaching aspiration. It's about letting people know that it's there. Aspiration is everywhere, everywhere. And it's, it's, it's up to the only thing that you can teach is a work ethic. If you know, if you have a work ethic, you can then do anything you want. Now, if you have a work ethic, you could go and sign up to a big company, go and sit in their office and work there for 20 years, do work every Monday to Friday, get that paycheck, get the pension at the end. That's a good work ethic. And the other work ethic is to do it yourself. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make try and find the energy to inspire myself, push myself to do what I want to do. And not... Yeah, don't think you can't. Yes, of course, things are fucking hard to get. Very hard to get. How hard do you want to work for it? It's up to you. It's not impossible. It's it's not impossible. Nothing's impossible. It's just hard. And you you own up to that. You're like, all right, cool. What do you want to do? You'll never catch me slacking. I will work fucking hard. And I've said it many times before to many people. You won't outwork me. I actually believe you because when I um, when I first got a place at the studio, obviously I went around and saw it and I was like, oh, this this is amazing, wow. Like, your work. Your, mm. your, I'm like, wow. And I'm telling you, for the last, after that, for the three months after that, I'm like, this looks familiar. And wherever I went, I would see your work. Mm. This looks familiar. This looks familiar. Well, I mean, look, there's, it, there's many av- avenues to it. And I think... You know, pigeonholing yourself to do... This is the thing about going to work for the man in a building, doing a thing. You do that one thing. I do so many different things. My hours are filled up with not just painting, with organising, with producing, with doing Excel spreadsheets, with doing budgets, with doing design, with doing whatever, organising artists, managing. That, like, it, it, you basically realise... The aspiration ended up basically getting so big it blew and now it literally is. I will do anything... I don't care. I will work for it because I know that's how it's done. There's no giving. No one's giving me shit. No one is giving me shit. And I'm glad for that. I've I've been given advice. No one's giving me anything. There's been no handouts. There's no money in my family. This, all it comes down to is work. Do you you think that comes down from where we grew up? Because we, I later found that we went to the same school, obviously at different um, times. And you have been sent, by the time I went to St. George's, I believe it was actually calmer than when you went. Yeah, and, and believe it was even worse before I got there. There you go. So do you believe your work ethic? My work ethic comes from my mum. Okay. I was, when I was born, we were homeless. My mum had £30. My dad stole everything from her. Um, and she was homeless. She had to get away from him. Dangerous man. Um, we then get a flat. And I'm six months old in West End Lane. The balcony falls off. It's an unsafe place. Then I get moved to Mortimer. So I grew up on Mortimer Estate with a single parent. And she was self-employed. Worked incredibly hard to feed me, to pay the bills, to have a car so she could drive. That is the most inspiring thing I've ever seen. And her work ethic and what she did to get out of this shit. Look, she still lives on the estate. I'm not rich. I don't own anything. I don't, I don't own a house. But what the, the energy she gave me, the, the, the understanding of what work can do and where it can take you from, she's my biggest inspiration. Wow. Obviously, that led to you being free, although you're working all the time. She inspired, she inspired the... I am free. 
she inspired the self-employment to a massive degree. And although we didn't have money growing up, like my mum repairs leather. She repaired motorcycle leather on Edgware Road, right? That's not a fucking big bucks business. That's paying the bills job, right? My mum was a seamstress all her life. And so she realised there's a, a niche in the market. No one's repairing these levers when the guys fall off the motorbikes, the couriers, all that type of shit. So she started this business on Edgware Road, starts repairing levers for people. That's what brought me up. A very simple job. But she put the fucking hours in. And um, to, to think that that thing, that job, brought me up is amazing. And to know how she did it and she didn't stop, you know. Just, that's so inspiring. And she just, it showed me, like, she decided to have Thursday afternoons off. She would work half day on a Thursday. I'm thinking, yeah, boss, never, boss is never going to do that for you. Yeah, of course you can have half day Thursday. Oh. And actually, when Josh was born... I was working, I've worked in a phone shop, I've worked as a postman, I've worked in Ikea, I've had all these jobs. And when I had Josh, I was actually working at a phone shop. And I, I couldn't, and Josh is living in London, right? I'm living in Brighton. Me and his mum ain't together, I've never been together since he was born. Um, I would have to wait to see when my boss was going to allow me time off to go and see him. I'm like, fuck this shit, man. No, I want to grow up with my son. You ain't going to tell me when. So, no, quit the job. This, that's around the same time the painting happens. I'm selling spray paint, weed, all that type of shit, shit jobs. Fuck all of that. I'm going to be, do Rare Kind. That's when Rare Kind as a company yeah. was born. And, and, and you in Brighton, and you would come here on a Friday, take Pick Josh to Brighton, yeah. and on a Sunday, bring him back. Yeah, with the buggy, carrying it up and down the stairs on the underground. Like, did that for 10 years straight. Beautiful. And then Rare Kind started off, what was their inspiration? So Rare Kind was a graffiti crew initially started in 1996 with me and my friend Gareth. Um, he thought of the two letters. Are, basically, in, in graffiti, you have your name. Mm. And then the moment you team up with someone or team up with a few people, you make a crew. It's not about gangs. It's nothing like that. It's just yeah. you represent these people. You, you people have got the same mind state, so you're going to represent that. So Gareth came up with the two letters RK for the crew. I thought of Rare Kind. And uh, so that started. We painted that everywhere. Done wicked with it. When it got to 2003, February, and I'm thinking, well, I've got the money now to open this shop. I'm going to call it the Rare Kind Gallery. I'm going to keep representing my crew. Mm. And I am. Yeah. And, then, and from that, Rare Kind record store. So, yeah, Rare Kind Gallery opened. And then... I did Rare Kind Clothing, which went on for years. We've done Rare Kind Records, which will be in Brighton, has been in Brighton for 18 years now. Still there, Rare Kind Records. Um, and then I came back to London, opened up the gallery in London, and that, then I set up an agency after that, and I shut the gallery. So the gallery was open in total for about 10 years. That, that is beautiful. And how do you then connect with this artist? Because I know working with people is one of the hardest things. I think one of the things I'm really lucky for is that I am an artist. Mm. So initially, the work, whilst I had the shop, and before I had the shop, actually, when I decided this is what I was going to do for a business, but and then obviously having the shop and then agency, I knew I could produce pretty much anything the client wanted, any client. I'll figure it out. I'll figure out a way to paint it. But then as time goes on, your crew gets bigger, there's more people about, and you're like, well, you know what, Will can do that, Tan can do that, Jimmy can do that, Alex can do that. I'll just take my percentages. And all of a sudden, you've got a roster of artists. You've got a load of people, you've got all these services you can offer. So whereas before it was me offering my services, I might be a bit of a jack of all trades. I'm not the best portrait painter. I'm not the best typographer. I'm not the best abstract artist. But you know what? Will's amazing at abstract. Alex is brilliant at typography. Da, 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 da. So then you start giving the client exactly what they want, 100% amazing work, you just get your management fee with it. And um, so as I've worked with hundreds of artists over the years. And um, when I set up the agency originally, I signed 20 people to my name. I did that for about three years and I just felt bad because what happens is, and it's always been this way, is I get the call, David, we need this done. What can you do? And it was very rare that they would say, David, we've looked on the agency and we want this artist. Very rarely happened. 
And it's only because of the nature of the business and how it was represented, who I was to the people that I was meeting. So then I thought, like, you know what, it's a bit bad to have X person signed to me and never get any work from me. So you know what, let me cut that. I will just represent whoever. The client will contact me, ask me what, they'll tell me what they want, and then I'll, I'll know who to pick. So you're not signed to my agency. You don't feel like, why aren't Daz getting me work, man? What's going on? There's no expectancy there. But you know, without signing to me, I'll be like, job comes in. I'm like, all right, cool. Francis, I've got this thing. Do you want to do it? You're more happy. More about grateful. It. Exactly. Grateful, yes. but also like you're off doing your thing. You're not sat there waiting. Yes. You know I've got a, a profile of yours on my website, yet you're not getting any work. That's, that's not a nice feeling. So I stopped all of that. And now I, I just know. So with, with you knowing the hard work ethic you have now, you then said, you know what? I can work smarter. Yeah, that's what it's about. You've got to work you know, smart. I mean, I'm not the smartest worker, but I have to work smart. That's the point. You have to work that's, smart. That's, that is, that is, because what I find is a lot of young adults, even grown, fully grown adults out there, they don't understand the power of delegating. Well, Allow someone who do best at what they do, mm. let them do it. I mean, look, I'm extremely guilty of that. Yeah. It's, as far as I go is knowing I've got artists to do that shit. But I am so guilty of doing everything. I'm really bad at delegation. Even when I had my shop, for the 10 years I had three managers run it for me. They weren't managing shit. I was managing everything. And not because they weren't good. You I just, you just I couldn't let it go. It. I couldn't. And Vex, my partner, would be saying to me, what the fuck, what are you doing? You're paying this guy. Yeah, but, yeah, but, but you're sweeping. Why are you sweeping? You're paying this guy. What are you doing? Why are you folding t-shirts? What are you doing? He's here. I was really bad at it, and I still am. You just, you love your baby, you want hands on, you moved on. I just want it to be done right, yeah. in my, my eyes. This is how I did it. I was, this is the thing, I wasn't taught. So I wasn't taught a system. I didn't go to uni and get told, this is how you do. Which then, the same people who went to that uni or on that course know, this is how you do. I made my shit up. Yeah. I can't explain it. All right, it might be as simple as a sweeping. I know how it's got to be swept. I made it up. <laughs> <laughs> you missed the spot. Bro, I'm doing you didn't it. go the right way. <laughs> you should hold the broom. Listen, let's have some common sense here. If the wind's blowing this way, you want to start here. Like, it's ridiculous. I'm a dickhead for it, and I know I am. And, you know, I, I annoyed the fuck out of my managers. I've annoyed anyone that worked for me in those shops. Like, I was a jar because I'm just controlling maybe, but... I just watch, I want shit done the same way. And oh, so, you know. Uh, that's beautiful. One I, of, I do let, a lot. Let's go back and we'll come for one of the, uh, was when I was researching you, the helicopter story in Rolly Way. Oh, mate, there's been a f- loads of them, but they, I've spoke about that one because it's fucking hilarious. I was like, and you wasn't scared in swapping no, jumpers with your mates it, and just walking Listen, out? We painted the roundabout, me and Greg, we painted the roundabout as uh, at the top of, I can't remember where it touches basically. Swiss Cottage, we painted on this block, we were blatantly taking a piss, it was too early, we got spotted, police come, we run. So we're running, heading back to the blocks, we're running back into Rowley. Yeah. We're just laughing, because this fat policeman's behind us, just not catching us. <laughs> but bear in mind, I'm a bit of a chubby guy, right? <laughs> Greg's just like fit and healthy, and he's just zoomed off into the blocks. I'm laughing my head off, wobbling down the road. And I'll get into the estate, I managed to get myself to the top floor and I see my friend Jason. And we look, we're at the top of the state so we can see both ends and we just see police have just lock off. I, what a fucking waste of money for one. But anyway, they did And it. your mum says you can't come oh, in. Oh, bro. Listen, so anyway, Jason's like, look, we'll get you out. Swap jumpers, I'm going to walk you out. So we swap jumpers. He walks me down the stairs. We walk up to the front of the block. Police everywhere, walk right through him. Across the road, I walk into Abbey, he goes off. I run across Abbey Estate, I jump the wall, run into my estate. My mum's on the balcony. She's like, that's for you, isn't it? I said, yeah, you're not coming in, fuck off. I had to spend another two hours on the road. I obviously couldn't go back to Rowley to my friends because the fucking estate's locked off. Yeah. The helicopter's wondering what this fucking kid's doing running around the estate by himself. I had to go and hide. And yeah, she was used to that shit. My mum went through shit with me, man. She went, I brought blessing. a lot of drama to that fucking front door. That is a blessing. blessing. And one thing, because one thing with you, the way we met was, was special. You'd done, you'd done some work for me. And I was like, wow, this guy really is there. He's like, he's like, Francis, it's nothing. I'll do it. Your marketing strategy is 
crazy. Um, I can honestly say you're inspiration to me. So when I started um, doing this and I'm researching and I started listening to your podcast, I actually listen to a lot of them. And I'm like, which is a shame you're not going to bring it back. The chapter. Bro, I started last night. I, I know you started the podcast, Start, like, started again, but yeah, you're yeah. not doing the chapters. I'm not doing the chapters, no. I, ain't, I literally ain't got the time. I, I'm honestly, I just want to take this opportunity and say for the very short space of time we've met, you've had, you have inspired um, me. So grateful I, to I hear thank that. Thank you for that. For and I'm glad that you started uh, F24 back. Yeah. Why F24? And just let us know a little bit more about that. So the podcast is... Um, I've obviously done lots of stuff in my business, met lots of different artists, had this amazing time. And I've seen, I've met people who are like me from the estates. I've met people who've been to uni that are from Highgate. All types of people. And especially in graffiti, the fucking breadth of the types of people that are in graffiti is ridiculous from working class to upper class. There's even been a prince in graffiti. Um, an actual prince of, oh. of, of a nation is a graffiti oh, is it? Like, yeah. So graffiti is massive did, and it, it so covers all aspects of Did the prince have to do it? No one could know as a prince. Uh, not, I'm not sure. He's not an English prince. Yeah. He was from Argentina. Some, I'm not sure where he's from. Oh, wow. South America. Some, anyway, connected fam, royal family shit, yeah. like solid done. But anyway, but the point being is that I'd met all these different types of people in graffiti. I've obviously met a lot of them through the professional world of graffiti as well, where they're making money. And I was like, well, look, I think these stories are important. Let me, need, let me know these journeys, man. I want to know how people got to do what they do. And um, so I started, I love podcasts for one. Combat Jack Show was the first one I listened to. And then it went on to many others. I, li- I still I probably got about 15 things I listen to every week. But I was like, my people ain't had a voice yet. I want to hear a proper graffiti. I want to hear a proper one about creatives. Ideally, a lot of graffiti writers, but I don't care if they're musicians, whatever, whatever whoever I meet. And so, yeah, I just started this recording this thing. I did six of them with friends of mine. And then I didn't put them out. I was just like, nah. You're not good enough. You can't do that. Because you're a perfectionist. Well, yeah, but also I'm not a broadcaster. Again, yeah. it's something I wasn't taught. My, like, my self-esteem, even though I work really hard and I've achieved, my self-esteem level is quite low. Wow. And uh, so I battle with my self-esteem quite yeah. a lot to achieve. And um, I did these six, left them on the hard drive. Done the edits, but left them on the hard drive. And then... My friend Jan died of a drug overdose. And I was just like, I would have interviewed Jan. His story's amazing. And why am I not putting these out? Jan's gone now. I could have done an interview with him and put it out. No, right, that's it, I'm doing it. I'm, I'm stepping up. I can't, I can't have the people I know pass away about this story being told, these stories being told. I need to archive this shit. And so then I started and um, I started putting them out. and. Yeah, I've done 66 now. Yeah. <laughs> At one point, like, how many am I going to listen to just to... But you know what? You just love it because the stories, they're just, like, so authentic. And you don't hear them anywhere else. And what I love about it is you don't care how big they are. What they just got a story. Come on, let's sit down mm. and let's enjoy it's it. It's not even about achievement. It's not yeah. about... It's not a bragging place. It's not somewhere where you come and tell me what paint you use or how many trains you painted or, you know, what creative thing you've smashed. It's not even about that. I just want to know the story of how you got to there. And it, you could literally be... Well, it doesn't, it, I don't care what you are. If you're creative, let me talk to you. I don't care, I don't care if I don't know you. Let me talk to you. Because all the stories are interesting, man. Yeah. I like to know where people are born. I like to know what their parents did. I'd like to know what their experiences are. How did you find culture? What was it? And there's all fucking a million and one funny stories about how people came across what they like. And um, then how that inspires them to go off and become creative. Like you, For me, it was, I became a graffiti writer. I'm painting, I painted the canvas for my son's birthday seven years later. And then that's the shit. I'm like, oh, look, that's your life. Yeah. And so 20 years now, I've been... In the creative world, with no education, and you're doing amazing. And it's funny how how hindsight plays tricks on us because mm. you came up with the name Rare Kind. Well, your partner came out of RK, yeah. Rare Kind. In today's world, you actually a Rare Kind. I say that to say this because you don't like social media. You don't like it. commenting. You don't like Mm-mm. leaving messages. And what you do, you do it for the love, which a lot of people Listen, are doing the opposite. Look, this fucking immediate. Um, it's immediate attention that we require. It's wrong. 
And the thing is, what's happened is they've opened up, when I say they, social media businesses, have opened up this thing inside us that make us require it more. Now, I'm, I'm as guilty as everyone else. I put a post up, I want to see them fucking likes. I want that dopamine <laughs> hit. Are you kidding me? I want that. That's why, I, partly I put it up for love, of course. I yeah. want to share. Oh, look, art's oh, amazing. It saves lives. It's the best thing in the world. And this is what I've paid. This is what my friends paid. Yeah. Look at this photo. Where's my fucking like? <laughs> So I'm very selfish with it because I don't like anyone's photos and I don't comment. But it's mainly for my own protection. Yeah. I don't want to get caught up in that world. I'm already, if I'm posting, I'm caught up. Yeah. I step in any further and start commenting on everyone's pieces, that's 10 minutes gone. I start fucking liking everything, that's another 10 minutes gone. And before you know it, two hours of my day is gone on fucking Instagram. No thanks. So with that said, but yet, still, you expect people yes, to come that, in and like But you, you don't have to. My but you don't get offended. No, of course I don't. Yeah. I don't give a fuck, really. But yeah. I can't deny, like, why would I use Instagram if I didn't want the dopamine hit? I don't need to use Instagram for my yeah. business. I don't get work from Instagram. I get work from my portfolio. Mm. I get work from meeting people and saying, this is what I do, this is what I want to do for you. Let's do this. I don't get it because of Instagram. I put photos on Instagram for a dopamine hit. Let's not get it twisted. Yes, I might. I post very rarely. I post three or four peak pictures a month. I, I, you know, I keep my interaction down to a minimal. But I'm an addict like the rest of us. And when I say the rest of us, I mean every fucker. Mm. We're all addicted to this shit. And it's fucking us up. And it's not right for human beings. But this is where we're at. And we'll mm. see where it goes. We'll figure out. We'll see the, the damage or the amazingness. Maybe it's giving everyone confidence. Who knows? But as far as I'm concerned, it's a waste of time. I want to keep off it. So I put my picture up. I appreciate the likes and I want them and I appreciate them. But that don't, don't pull me in. I'm not going any further. I'm not wasting my time. You, I already waste time looking. Yeah. I can't imagine. If I start getting into conversations, are you mad? I'm too busy for that. You're way too busy. And, and I, I get... want to be too busy as well. I don't want to have the time for that. That is beautiful. When I was your... Because I wasn't <clears throat> sure... Should I say some of the people he's worked with, the companies? You have worked with some, wow, like coming from where you've come from. Mm. Please tell it, just tell them. When I, sh I set up the shop, I opened the shop to sell paint to graffiti writers, right? Mm. And then to try and sell art to, to people who wanted to buy art. Now, Brighton's a great place for that because there's a lot of gay people. You have the pink pound which is basically money that's not spent on... They don't have kids. The majority of gay people don't have kids. They, they spend money, right? They spend more money than straight people because they haven't got the same... Right? So there's the pink pound in Brighton. And you've got to try and get it. If you've got a business in Brighton, you want the pink pound because it's a continuous float. So I'm trying to sell paintings to them people and whoever else wants to buy them. I'm selling spray paint. But it's fucking hard to pay the rent, man, doing that. It's a fucking niche business. Selling paintings is a hard fucking job. And I opened the gallery at 23 years old. Who's going to walk into a fucking gallery of a boy of a new era? Ha ha um, I'm 41, I still look exactly the same, apart from my hair. You did, it was a bit chubby. And exactly. The I, was like, is that? I was like, is that David? The hair was the coming hair. <laughs> But the point being, it was hard to be that age selling yeah. paintings, right? So it got to a point in 2004, I hadn't paid, the business, I hadn't paid my shop rent for six months. No chance of paying the rent, wasn't making the money. And then faking it on Channel 4 came to me. And they said, come and do this programme. We'll give you a thousand pound. I was like, fuck off. I can't take a month off for a thousand pounds. And you got arrested the night before. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, the night, actually, the night before they turned up, I'd been arrested for graffiti. But anyway, <laughs> it's because I painted. But anyway, I managed to get a good fee out of these people. And they came and filmed me for a month. That aired in September 06, I think that was. And when that aired, literally on the Sunday, the Monday morning, shop phone goes, is that David? Saw you on telly yesterday. Got four grand up here for you. Come do this job. And that was it. That was the start. And so that was a, a, a fund manager. So that's the, the level above a stockbroker. A fund managing office in the Strand. That guy, his name is Ian. I won't tell you his second name. He commissioned me six times in two years to paint the same wall. So to give me four grand, six Just times time. over two years, basically put money into the business and made it strong. Had I not done faking it, I don't know if I could have survived. 
because the business was too small. I wasn't making enough money. I definitely wasn't making enough money to pay people or myself. We were getting through, you know, but it was hard fucking work. The moment I was on TV and I got that attention, that's when my business kicked off and that's when things started to happen. And so it started off with him, which led into giving me a position. So then, oh, I can print my portfolios. This is back in the 2000s where it wasn't all digital yet. Mm. So I can print proper portfolios. I can do proper presentations. I can show people what we're capable of. One thing leads to the next, you get bigger and bigger and the work starts coming in. And I've done various offices around London while I was living in Brighton, got paid well all off the back of Ian, introducing me. People go to his office, wow, look at this painting, who done that? Oh, you want to call David? Give him my number. And it would change all the time. Constantly, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I had his wall changing six times. I'm being called to Cannon Street to paint another office. I'm being called to this place to paint another office. This, they loved it. They loved it, these fucking stockbrokers. Loved it. So I'm painting these pieces everywhere, making amazing money, which is all it's doing, though, is paying for the shop to stay open, paying for mm. me to look after Josh, paying my staff, paying, the, you know, very rare to buy trainers. It wasn't that money. The money was going to business. Um... So that, that's what kicked it off. That's what enabled me to really fucking like, okay, cool, I'm on something now. Definitely on. When I'd had the shop open for two and a half years, that was what that, that solidified it. It made it solid. It gave it the fucking money, the funds it needed to continue. But we can then say safely that faking happen, happened because of the previous work you put oh, in. Oh, I mean, look, the fact is there was nothing like my shop in the, in mm. the country. There was nothing like it. You could, by that point, HQs in Brixton had opened up, right? But the two guys that ran HQs were militant graffiti writers. Kings of the scene. They're not going on camera. So they actually got offered first. They said, no, you need to go and chat to David. David's got the full picture. He's got a gallery. The HQs was a graph shop. So it's all spray paint. It's in cages. You walked into this little room and there's all cage paint. It wasn't really the setting for a film. And these two boys, the guys that own that shop, they're not up for being on camera. They are like... Hardcore graffiti writers. Undergrass. Yeah, this is years ago. It's not the yeah. current owners. And um, so anyway, they come to my shop. I have this big shop. I've got a flat big enough to house the guy. The whole picture's there. I'm a graffiti writer. I own a graffiti shop. We've got hip hop nights in there. All that type of shit. It basically made their fucking film. They were like, this is everything. That's what we wanted. So that's, yeah, it, it ran from that. That's amazing. And now we're fast forwarding to the current times, mm. you've worked, even during the corona, the, the lockdown period we had, you were still working. Yeah, I mean, it, it don't stop, man. I mean, look, over the years, I've worked for many brands, done lots of advertising campaigns, done lots of offices, done lots of packaging, done lots of various products. When I, I did Ace Hotel in Shoreditch, which unfortunately closed down last year, did the whole hotel, 260 rooms. Mm. 40 something artists. That was my biggest job to date back then. Various projects. And then smashed it in 2019. I worked for Universal Movies for seven years, making campaigns for them. Gone brilliantly. Set up for 2020. It's going to be sick. Going back to Ace to do 70 rooms. Got two campaigns for Universal to do, four offices to do. And then three months in, bang, everything goes. So I was like, okay. Understandable, I'm not the only one. Firstly, our whole block outside, further. Worldwide lockdown. Business is different. What are you going to do now? And so I, I'm a hard worker. So I found my time was a bit freer. I was like, okay, cool, you're now going to paint. That's what makes you different from the rest because every time I walked by um, your office, I could see. Sometimes I'll say hello, sometimes like, I was even scared to say hello because you were just, you were painting and you were knocking them out. And I'm like, and that's what I'm saying. You, you literally inspired me. Like, oh, this guy's still working. You can't stop, man. Like, look, the point is you build strength through your life. Now use it. Now, if anything showed us, last year was the time you had to use the shit we were taught. Last year, everything got taken away from everyone. And we were told you were going to die if you stepped outside. Yes. Everyone was dead. So be scared. I'm like, what, what am I meant to do? Just sat, sit at home. Yeah. So I sat at home. I made a little studio in my garden because I wasn't coming here for two months. 
because I didn't know what was going on. My girl's like, no, I don't go. Mm. You don't know what's going on. So I, paint, I, made, I made a little studio in my garden at home, started painting, knocking out the paintings. Then came back here, decided I'm going to do a show or put a show together and just fucking carried it on. All my business was gone. There was no sign of any business coming. Yeah. The business I've been working on for 18, 19 years by that point, I thought I was going to finish Where it. Where most people would have folded and start thinking, a way out. You said, no, I'm painting. Yeah, I'm painting and I'm going to, I'm going to do more things. So I, I, you mentioned in the intro, like I released 16 magazines last year. I produced 16 magazines last year. I, li- I love the name. Quarantine. Quarantine, I love the name. It's a zines for magazine. Yeah, and quarantine, quarantine book, exactly. Quarantine, yeah. And uh, that was just to celebrate artists, raise some money for a charity, and just just keep fucking working. Mm. I don't sit still well. I promise you, I do not sit still well. My girl, I've never been on a beach holiday, okay, ever. Ah. And before I met Bex, I'd never been on a two week holiday. Most I've been away for is a weekend. Like, I I don't I don't stop. Quite weird, I was actually chatting to my therapist about all of this this morning. Oh. I don't stop. So wh- what is success to you then? Oh, that's the fucking question. Because me people- looking outside, I see you a very successful man. Yeah. I'm not putting finance in, in the equation. I know what you mean. Mm. But you still going, what is success to you? Success to me is just achieving, man. Like- but you've achieved. But bro, I've still got 40 years left. How have I achieved? I like that. 40 more summers at least. I'm hoping I'll go to 82 longer. So that's 40 more summers of work. What can I produce? Who can work for me? And for themselves really, but so I get a little change. Like who, who can do what? What can I do? It doesn't stop, bro. You've got to constantly... We're, we are free. I've got no boss. I work for people, yes. I've got no boss. Like, it's up to me what I do. And I'm, you will never see me. You won't see me stopping. Now, my therapist thinks there's something there, and she's probably right. It's probably down to how I was born, what it was like being poor, all that type of shit. It's probably, I don't want to be that way. I want to make sure I'm covered. I want to make sure my son's covered. I'm working towards this, this, and this. But at the same time, and I said to Charlotte, my therapist, I was like, listen, love, I just fuck it. It's the best thing. I don't, what's better? What's better than achieving? I love, that. I love it. It's, it's interesting. You, you, it's again, one of the most interesting. You actually, from, you guys from where we're from, mm. the word therapist, <laughs> it's a no-no. But you openly yeah, man. speak about it. Yeah. How important... So look, is it? I had I had a very traumatic time in Kilburn, like certified PTSD shit. Now I could tell you every single part of it, right? And I thought, and especially when I met Bex and I'm with her for five years, and my girl is a white middle class girl. I can make, I, I, I've made her cry on many occasions with my stories, not on purpose. You just tell the story, and she's like, "Fuck," she's crying. It's it's sad. It's upsetting. Now. I thought, because I knew everything that I'd been through, I didn't block any of it out. I knew what happened, when it happened, what I'd been through, the pain I'd caused, the pain that was caused to me, all of that. She's like, you need to see a therapist. No, I don't. I know everything. And she'd be on at me for a time. She was like, it's not about that. My behaviour was wild. My anger was wild. Like my, my poor staff of my shop, bro. I'd cause some mayhem in that shop to the people that work for me because I've got fucked up respect values I've got or had should I say and I'm working on them more and more and it, uh, amazing level now but I'm still not perfect of it as I say I've got self esteem issues I don't think much of myself sometimes so then you, you feel lesser and then you protect and you're coming from Kilburn you better protect properly this ain't saying oh, I don't want to be involved this is bang I'm not involved it's not right and shit got really, really intense. I blew up twice at my girlfriend. I didn't hit her, but the anger level was ridiculous. Uncalled for. That is not a row. That's disrespectful. You don't talk to people that way. I went mental. 
The first time I got away with it, shouted at her, went mad, slammed the doors. It's awful behaviour, awful. And I knew it was wrong. I knew where it was coming from and why. I'm from Kilburn. Shit was raw. That's what happens. What she taught me is that it doesn't have to stay that way. Now, I'm lucky. She's a, I've been with her 17 years. This woman's amazing. Mm. She really... She found someone she loved, but she knew he wasn't complete. And she didn't try to change me. She just wanted me to know that I can change. I can figure this shit out. I don't have to behave in this way. You don't have to react like that with people. And especially as I was living in Brighton, I wasn't even living in Kilburn anymore. In Kilburn, you've got to be a certain way, especially coming from the estates. You've got to be, if you're going to be outside, you've got to be a certain way. I'm in Brighton, sunny Brighton. Sunny seaside Brighton. What's the swagger for? What's the anger for? And I never understood. And I was like, no, no, I know what it is. It's because of Kilburn, because of Kilburn. And then it was two big rows. The second row, she's like, look, I'm going to leave you if you do this to me one more time. You can't talk to me this way. Literally went straight to the doctors that morning. And I was like, look, I need to see someone. This is ridiculous. Oh, no, 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 you don't. No, no, I'm, I'm not leaving until you get me an appointment with a therapist. So I did six sessions with an NHS therapist and then went straight to paid therapy for 18 months. And it changed my life. Changed. Therapy completely changed my life. I'm now in my second round of therapy and I've been in it for another 18 months actually and I don't see this one stopping for a while mainly because I can afford it. Um, therapy, what it does, what it takes off you, what you learn to understand about yourself, your behaviours, your patterns, it's amazing. Yeah. And the main thing is these people ain't got answers. They're just willing to listen and provide the right questions for you to just go a bit further, a bit deeper, a bit further. And the more understanding you get of your behaviour, the better you are at changing that behaviour. And, um, you know, cannabis has been a massive part of my life forever, for a long, long time. And I've smoked a lot of it. There was an incident last year. I'm horrified that I did it. I hate my behaviour and what happened that day. But what ended up happening was that I realised, well, look, you're in therapy... So you're doing good there, right? But you've still got this anger issue. You've still got this respect issue. You've still got this, if people look at you in a certain way, you want to slap them. You don't have to live like that. You're not in, you're not in a, no one's threatening me. I haven't, I'm not living in a threatening environment. I don't work in a threatening environment, yet my reaction is still very much like that's the case. So I, I acted out last year and I realised, okay, cool. Although I'm doing therapy, I'm full of cannabis from six in the morning till I go to bed. So I'm not really 100% myself. Let me stop the daytime smoking. Just cut the smoking down completely. So now I'm only smoking two little joints a day now. But just the power I've even got off the back of that is shit I'm capable of. I thought, I was getting, cannabis is life to me. Why are you not smoking it all day? Why are you not smoking it all day? This is the best. You're missing out. This is the shit. And yes, it is brilliant. And I still think it's the best thing on the planet, the best plant ever. But I wasn't present enough. I wasn't in the moment enough. And I caught myself off guard and I was a dickhead. And I've apologised for it, but I was a dickhead. And uh, so therapy, cutting down on the weed smoke... A lot comes of it, man. A lot of great things come of it. And I'm from a place where you don't go to therapy and you smoke a lot of weed. Yeah. And so I've done the opposite. And it's... I guess it, it, for some, some cases, for those who can't afford therapy or think mm -hmm. therapy is therapy so ain't manly cheap, enough... Man. Therapy ain't cheap. You can find people just to talk to the right Listen, people. man. I, I think the point being is that fuck the bravado. Fuck all of that. I don't care who you are, what you've been through, what, what fucking bowl, balls you've shown to anyone and how tough and whatever. If, you're, if you know, and we all know when we've got mental health problems, and it's weird because we were never told about mental health as kids either. Mm. The fact is, we've all, every single person on the planet has got a mental health problem. It, there's just various levels to it. And if you're suffering, find that fucking free number and call it. Now, you can go to the doctors and they'll get you six free sessions on the NHS. 
Sometimes it's enough, sometimes it isn't. What I've been through, I needed more. But um, luckily, I'm in a position where I can spend that money. So yes, I pay for mine. It's fucking expensive, but it's worth every goddamn penny. And if we were in America, we had to pay for healthcare, you broke your leg, you've got to go and pay for that to be fixed. It's the same for your brain in the UK. You go and pay for it to be fixed. Like, that's all I'm doing. It's like private healthcare. Uh, you, we're lucky we've got the NHS and fingers crossed it stays forever. But, yeah, I spend a lot of money on trainers. I've spent fucking hundreds of thousands of pounds on cannabis. I buy clothes. I buy expensive jeans. What, you can't pay £70 to speak to someone about your own brain, about your own head that's really doing your nutting, that's making you behave in different ways. But you'd rather spend £70 on that pair of trainers. You're mad. Wow, that is powerful. So what I want to finish off with is being a man who's probably gone through the emotions of life you can think of the high the low being homeless from birth literally luckily i don't remember if my mum experienced yeah, that, of, i didn't yes yeah, yeah. i'd be worried if you did you'd be a special yeah, family hell, yeah, yeah. Yeah. i was like no yeah. <laughs> but being that what advice would you give to anyone out there who feels the world is coming to an end just understand nothing's easy for one but don't be scared of that fact. That, that's just the baseline. Nothing's easy. Okay, cool. All right, I, I, I'll admit that. I'll understand that. Nothing's mm. easy. But what that requires is hard work. We can do anything. It depends how much you're willing to put in. That's literally all it is. That's as much information as I've, I've understood on this planet is that you want to do something, you work towards doing it that's it there's no shortcut there's no shortcuts anywhere the shortcuts tend to happen they come into play after the hard work's been done because before you know it you're working so hard that person's noticed and instead of you having to go up that ladder this person goes oh come here i'll bring you up here because you're already up you've climbed up the scaffolding you're going up you're getting higher and higher from your hard work and then oh there's a little shortcut here because this person's noticed they'll, they'll, they'll drag you through and then your other friend's doing amazing. They're going to pull you up as well. But that initial bit, you want to get over that fucking curve? It's up to you, bro. You've got to step up. You have to. And it's incredibly hard for some people. I've got friends of mine who sold coke for fucking years. And they're like, D, how am I going to get out of this, man? How am I going to do it? And I said, listen, bro, I'll admit it. You're under the level. You've got a lot of work to turn away all that money. You've got to fucking change your lifestyle. You've got to fucking step slowly out of this. Make sure you don't get nicked on route. And then you're going to be at zero. Then you've got to work hard. Because if you want all what you had down there, up here, but it's not impossible, are you prepared to do it? And if you're not, cool. But let's be honest. There's no excuses. Work. That's all there is. And it can bring amazing things absolutely amazing things what i'm doing at the minute the biggest biggest project of my life is only due to hard work no one gave me shit this this big boss man who i'm working for now he didn't give me shit he didn't give me an opportunity no i had to prove myself to the man this is my portfolio this is what i want to charge you this is why i'm going to charge you this this is who's going to come and do it all right cool let's go and all of that takes work years of work to be able to walk up to that man, this fucking billionaire, and say, look, I'm doing this. Really? Yeah, watch. Within a month, I proved it to him. Ladies and gentlemen, we won't get into that project because that is going to be the reason why we're going to have sit-down number two with Mr. Sanders. <laughs> there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. If a man can come from nothing, sees his mother work hard more than anything you can think of, if his own mother can inspire him to be the most hardest working person he has ever known, even still that's not enough for him, imagine what he can do. As they say, hard work will beat talent any given day if talent doesn't work hard enough. Oof. Till next time, love, peace and happiness. Oh, don't forget to share, subscribe, like and comment. You know, David is gonna li not going to like, but you can like. I'll tell you what, don't forget, art saves. Art saves. Thank you.
love people. Oh.